Thank you, Luke, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for being part of this community. We're in it together. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Sydney. After a few years away, it is wonderful to be reunited as a group. So thank you all for turning out. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's brightening my morning. Hey, so let's get started. I have a lot to talk about. I want to get, uh, get right into this. I want to talk about two trends this morning, two major themes for 2023, the first of which is automation. To many, automation means the use of one of the products that's shown at the bottom of this diagram. It could be process mining or, or workflow or RPA or automation, sorry, or uh, intelligent document processing or AI. Any of these could constitute automation. However, I define it a little bit differently. To me, any or all of those could be automation, but what, what it really means is when software is helping you do the work. So no matter which of these products you're using, provided the software is helping you to get your work done, then, then you're, you're doing automation. Automation is probably the theme I hear about most these days. When people talk about the future of this industry or what they're looking for right now, they talk about automation. And I think that the reason that they do that is twofold. First, because all the technologies that are displayed on this slide are becoming more mature. And they're now reaching a point in their development that they can offer you a lot of benefits. The other main reason is because we all see the clouds on the horizon economically, and we realize that in a downturn, in a period of turbulence, we're going to be focused a little bit differently than usual. We're going to be thinking about efficiency and optimization and the products in automation and the general theme of having software help you do the work is especially relevant in a moment of economic uncertainty. So for both reasons, automation seems like it's the top thing on the agenda when I speak to customers, which I do all the time. However, there's another theme behind, behind the scenes, and I really want to talk about two themes today. By the way, while we're on automation, I want to mention that though that picture looks good, it seems like the technology is meeting the moment, I want to say not everything's perfect about automation. You look at those technologies, those five, they're typically used two separately. Too much of the time, you'll see somebody using one of them, even though it's obviously complementary, synergistic with another one, they're not using the other. You see process mining models, process mining run in order to figure out what's inefficient about your processes and then it doesn't really translate into workflow or the creation of a new process model. Or you'll see APIs being used, but everything the API can't handle is not automatically routed to RPA or AI that could have handled that issue. So we still see too much of a divergence, a separatism amongst these automation technologies. And the other thing that's the problem about these technologies is that they tend to work on data narrowly, which is to say that typically you have an application or a function running on one data set only, and you don't have enough breadth. You don't have the awareness of the other data that exists across the enterprise that would have added something to the work you're doing, but it's too hard to reach it. So you don't end up reaching it. You end up just focusing on one narrow set of data. Narrow application of data is a problem, not just in automation, but across your enterprise. But it's definitely a problem here in automation because automation is all about being simple, right? It's efficient. It's supposed to be for optimization, which means is to say you don't want to invest too much in creating a complex automation. You want to move quickly. And if something's hard, you tend not to do it. So if it's hard to connect to data, if data is scattered or remote or hard to access, you need special permissions, you've got to be a data expert, you typically don't include that. And as a result, automation shows the symptom of data narrowness even more vividly than the rest of your enterprise applications probably do. All right, so there's a few cracks in this picture, but it's still the goal of 23 for a lot of good reasons. I just want to get behind it. I want to say, look, Automation may be the overall goal that we're all going to aim toward in the year ahead, but the means to automation is going to be convergence. I think that we've got, we've got a means and ends issue here. Convergence is the means by which we're doing it, and that's what's happening behind the curtain. If you were to talk to any vendor, they would tell you, if they're being honest, they would say the real theme of the coming year is convergence. Automation may be what you want, but convergence is what the vendors are struggling with. Uh, the, the convergence is important. 
let me prove. Let me prove to you how important it is by, by statistics. If you take just those products that I showed in the previous slide, those five products, which by the way is a pretty good map of what Appian does, right? We do those five things. You take those five products and you take the top nine or 10 competitors in this, in this market, and here are some statistics that describe their commitment behind the scenes to convergence, right? They've written 55 press releases in the past year about convergence, about bringing together those technologies to form a more, a more cohesive whole for you, bringing the functionality of one into alignment with the functionality of another so that you can use the pieces of automation as partners. Again, this is just across those 10 companies. Across the same group and the same technologies, there's been 19 technology partnerships announced. Now, a technology partnership it's basically like two companies saying they've each got half the puzzle, and if you only buy both of them, you'll have the whole puzzle. Now, I'm a skeptic of this. I don't think it actually works. Uh, and I think in particular in this situation, it will not work. And sometimes a tech partnership is really a sign that the vendors are behind the market, that they're actually struggling to keep up with what you're asking for. And so this is the quick fix, is to say, well, we may not have all the functionality, but we have a partnership, and if you just buy both companies, then you'll have it. The reason it won't work here, in my opinion, is because the synergies between the components of automation are so strong. You've got so many handoffs between the two. You've really got to do it well in a way that you could only do if the same vendor controlled both. And then furthermore, there's going to be such demand for getting this right because the ability to change and be coherent is going to be so strong that you won't tolerate two different vendors, each providing you part of the puzzle. So I don't think it's going to work, the technology partnership angle. I don't think it's going to work. I think it actually plays on certain myths, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the great, uh, the great myths of our industry right now is that a partnership is good enough to give you the synergy. Another one of my favorite myths is um, uh, this will all work when you put your data into a single place, right? These things, I, they're just canards that are out there and eventually we're gonna realize that this isn't gonna work. But, but in the meantime, you, you kind of have to deal with these legends. So anyway, tech partnerships, that's one way that people are trying to establish cohesion a bit between these technologies. Another one, and we're guilty of this one, is uh, acquisitions, just outright buying a company that uh, gives you certain functionality and allows you to complete the spectrum of automation technologies. We've done a few of these. Uh, there have been 16 acquisitions in our space in the past year, and not necessarily small ones either. They add up to $2.5 billion US altogether. So major acquisitions are happening. So, so look, where you're, you're seeing a lot of press releases, uh, a lot of partnerships, a lot of acquisitions, just amongst a small group of companies. And eventually, of course, even the press catches up, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the press and the analysts, and they're writing articles about it. And it's becoming, I mean, they're making predictions. They're, they're talking about the convergence of automation technologies. Uh, so everybody's talking about it. This is what's happening in our industry behind the scenes. And I want to just do a checkpoint here. Are you with me so far? I'm not saying it, nothing too controversial here. I'm just talking about automation is the ends, convergence is the means, and behind the scenes, everybody's doing it. Okay. So with that in mind, I want to jump into a little bit more futuristic uh, approach here. In my opinion, convergence is not going to be a single plane phenomenon, but a dual plane phenomenon. Convergence is going to happen simultaneously on two planes. Now, it has become fashionable lately to call these planes fabrics. So fine, I call them fabrics. The lower one would be a data fabric and the upper one would be a process fabric. These two fabrics are equally important and they're going to reinforce each other's value in a way that's not just additive, but multiplicative. You're gonna get surprisingly much value out of putting the two of these together. And I want to spend the middle of my presentation convincing you, hopefully, that this is where we're going and that it's going to be big. The convergence on one plane is one thing and that's good, but convergence on both is transformative and revolutionary. So that's really what I'm going to try to get across. You remember the two flaws in the, uh, in the situation that I described around automation? The first one was that the technologies were too separate and the second was that they had narrow access to data. Well, this is an answer 
to those problems. It's also an answer to a trend that I've seen in the last few years. In the pandemic, it became very obvious that we all had to adapt quickly in order to survive. Businesses needed to be able to pivot and be agile in order to keep up with the changes in their environment. Right? Customers were buying in new ways, employees were working in new ways, new regulations were coming out, you had to fund yourself in difficult times, you had, I mean, all these things were, strategies were changing. All of this was sudden and change was necessary in order to keep up and it kind of accelerated a problem. I mean, we survived, right? But it accelerated a problem that we've been seeing for decades, which is we solve a problem with a solution and we create a silo. And if you do that a hundred times, you have a hundred silos. And if you do it a thousand times, you have a thousand silos. And every time you do it, you disperse a little bit more your enterprise architecture. You segregate and isolate your data. This had been happening already. It had been happening in first gear, but now we cranked it up to third gear in the last few years. And it's getting to be a problem. This incohesion, this uh, incoherence of information across your enterprise is costing you. If you can't bring the right data to bear at the moment of decision, then you're inefficient with the data you have. It should really be an effort to try to get the right data to support your answer, your decision, or your moment of contact with the customer whenever it happens. And if your data is scattered, and we have been scattering it more and more lately, then that is ever harder. So we have this trend that we kind of mastered agility lately because we had to to survive, and it led to even more fragmentation than we'd been experiencing otherwise. So that agility to fragmentation trend is becoming more of a problem. And I wanna say that I, I think this model, this two, two fabric model is going to be the answer to that problem as well. So let's look into it. At, at the lower level, we have the data fabric. Now, data fabric is a codeless way, if you haven't heard about it, it's people are talking about it lately, but uh, I'll just fill you in. Uh, a data fabric is a codeless way to make all your remote data behave like it's local data. So no matter where it is in your enterprise, you want to have easy access to it as if it were in your own local database. This is generally done with caches. You connect to sources around the enterprise and you build a cache of the things that are most essential and then that cache is ever ready. But cache is not the only way that you do this. You can also do it with real-time querying. And as we'll see when I talk about Appian's answer to this, you can even write back to your data fabric and have that write back carry all the way to the original data source. The data fabric is a tool for uniting your data scape and making all this data present and available when you have to make a decision. And that's great because we've all suffered by a, with a certain problem for years now. And the problem is, I have to make a decision right now, but the data that I need to make that decision is scattered and hard to access, so what do I do? And there's really three answers to that problem. The first answer is you, you make your decision based on only the data you have locally. That's the easiest and sadly the most common answer to the problem. The second answer is you aspire to a day in which all your data will be in the same place. Now, when I say that, I feel like it sounds ludicrous, and I don't see it realistically happening anywhere except in very, very small firms. But the, the rumor lives on, the dream, because certain large vendors still aspire to be the place where you put all your data. So you still keep hearing this, like, everything will be great, just give us all your data, right? It's not going to happen, but, but some people, generally big vendors, are holding out for the possibility that that may be the answer to your problem. Realistically, I don't think you want to compromise to only work on local data, and I don't think you can get to the point where you have all your data in the same place, so we need a third answer, and this is the third answer. The data fabric allows you to treat your entire enterprise as if the, the data is local, and so that give, it get, bridges you over the problem and makes a cohesion out of an incoherent architecture. So anyway, it's a great thing. Now the process layer, process fabric, excuse me, uh, is also converging. These technologies are the automation technologies. The ones I've drawn here, these are exactly the texts that make up automation. It's process mining, business process management or workflow, auto, artificial intelligence, intelligent document processing, anything else that's part of automation, that's what it is. These are all action-taking technologies. These are the ones that are helping you do the work. 
right? That's the process layer. It's the technologies that are helping you do the work. And wouldn't it be better to have them all tightly integrated? Well, absolutely it would. This is a frequent Appian theme. I talk about it more or less every time I speak in public. I go back to this theme about how we want to integrate this, how we've done this, we're pioneering it, we've put together this fabric. I still believe it really strongly. I think it's one of the biggest benefits that we can give you, but it doesn't stand alone. It would be good by itself, but it'd be really good if you did it this way. All right? If you, if you united on both planes, the process fabric and the data fabric, such that every technology in the process fabric could link to every data source in the data fabric, now you have what amounts to an N to N relationship between technologies and data. And when you have that, your power is not just increased additively, but multiplicatively. The, the ability to, to tap into data across your enterprise with every tool you use gives you a freedom that you have not had before. And it is the answer to the question that I just posed a moment ago, the one about how agility has led to fragmentation and that's bad. Agility has led to fragmentation, but this sews it all back together. No longer do you have to suffer with silos and have each process attached to only one data source. If you have a model like this, if you have the process fabric plus the data fabric, then you've overcome the dispersion that has been happening in accelerated fashion as we became more agile in the last few years. So some would call this hyper automation, which sounds like a sci-fi term to me, even though I did write a book by that name. And, uh, and I, I'd say that this diagram looks sci-fi enough to be called hyper automation. So I'm going to go with it. Uh, that's, that's my big theme. Now, I want to follow up by saying, I have more news, but that was just the big thinky theme. All right, uh, we have a lot of speakers today. Very pleased with the speaking lineup, wonderful logos, great efforts. I've been uh, talking with a lot of them lately, been around, you know, bouncing around town. You'll hear some really good stories from, from these terrific firms. We're, uh, we're proud to be working with them. One story you won't hear, because they're a long way away, is S&P Global, but I bring it up because they're a testament to what we're doing with data fabric. S&P Global's business is to compile data from many sources and serve it to their customers. Uh, they're a data source, a data aggregator. They take all this data in real time, they batch it, they, they load it out, and uh, they've been working with us for more than a decade in this capacity, but data fabric is perfect for them. They have used data fabric to connect to more than 100 data sources across their enterprise. They run more than 1,000 processes against all that data. They have 7,000 users against all that, and they have performed 100 million tasks uh, on that architecture. So a real deep user of data fabric, just to show right, what's possible with the new technology. I'm really excited about it. This is our fastest growing region in the world. Uh, another reason I really wanted to be here for today is to congratulate and thank this region for the terrific growth. Uh, these statistics are amazing. You may know that we've set up a new dev center in Chennai, in India. Uh, we're building that out as we speak. That we recently opened our first office in Japan. We're really excited about Japan. And these growth numbers, they speak for themselves. 422% community growth and more than 150% in customers and revenue. We're very proud of the growth that we've seen in this region, and we look forward to keeping it up and broadening our partnership with you. New usage means uh, more processes, and this I throw this in just because I'm basically amazed by it. Seven billion customer processes are now running on an annual basis. I admit I estimated 2022 in order to come up with this chart, but, but, but wow, seven billion. Uh, I, by the way, when I say a, a process, I mean a, I, an instance of a process. Like if you built one process and you ran it a thousand times, it would count as a thousand toward this total. It'd be a thousand. But still, seven billion. That means 19 million processes per day, 222 processes per second around the world and accelerating at a really fast rate. So I'm, I'm just uh, pleased to see where this is going in the right direction so sharply. Now, hey, speaking of data fabric, we were talking about this earlier. This is my favorite feature. 
this is really, and I've been saying it for a while, I've been saying it since we launched it a year and a half ago, this is the best feature in the entire Appian platform. And we're not satisfied, so we just keep working on it. This is a timeline of the recent increases, the new functionality, the new uh, in, in, in increments we're putting onto the product. And we won't stop because we know how effective this is and how much good it's causing. Uh, we've got a few new ones right now. I get to tell you very briefly about them, but you'll hear more in the afternoon. Uh, we, we built in codeless data modeling so that you, it's basically a wizard. It's a wizard to allow you to express the data model and the relationships between the entities that you're connecting back into the data fabric. And you could do that without code, right? You know, one to many relationships, that sort of thing. You structure your data model through a wizard now. And then, and then also we've got right back. So, you know, how data fabrics are often just a cache. Uh, ours is more than that. You can actually write to it and your, your amendments go all the way back to the source system. So you can treat your data fabric as a, as a full data model, right? That is your enterprise. You're reading from it, you're writing from it, that, that the data with which you're interfacing. So that's just, just super stuff. Uh, the adoption rates have been really high. This is an optional feature, by the way. It's not like you are forced to use it. And so our install base could easily have decided that they just didn't need it. They'd already done their integrations. Why bother doing them again through a data fabric? But in fact, they've enthusiastically taken it up and we've got 45% of customers using it uh, just 18 months after releasing the first version. So that's fantastic. Hey, if you're not using it, please take a look. This is seriously the best feature. So check it out. And it's revolutionary what you can do when you're connected to all the data across your enterprise for every action. Uh, one gratifying thing about building a business, I've been here 23 years, one, one of the best things about it is to see the business reach a scale when it can really start to help people in volumes. And, uh, and, and I love this statistic. We, we do 68 billion process automations in the course of a year at the pace that we're currently going, I think it's 2022. Uh, a process automation in this case is not just a process, it's an action within a process. You know, the typical process is maybe 10 actions. So 68 billion automations. And each one of those, you know, it's just a, a quick thing. Like you're, you're calling for data, you're reading, you're writing, you're, you're logging in, you're, you're writing an email or, or sending out a message. It's a simple, single action. But it would have taken a person maybe five minutes. And you'd, you know, that person would be making, they say, $20 an hour. And so that action would have cost maybe a buck 67, like a dollar 67. And if you add this up, it's actually just an enormous economic impact. It's $113.3 billion on an annual basis. Uh, I, I know, I know, and, and enough about big numbers, I'll stop. But uh, we are proud of this. Oh, there's the formula, you don't need it. Okay, so at, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned economic uncertainty. I used it as the reason why automation was going to be a big deal in 2023, and it is. But I wanted to come back to it because we've been thinking a lot about the economy lately and I know that you have too. In a situation like today, when the economy changes people's priorities, it will affect the, the, the things you want out of software. You'll be looking more for, uh, for the following things, for reliability, right? You'll want a vendor that you can really count on. And, uh, and I, I wanna say that we mean to be that vendor. Uh, Appian has a 99% gross renewal rate, which is to say that about every dollar of subscriptions in a year, 99 cents of that dollar are renewed. Uh, this is an, uh, a very unusual number in software. You typically don't see anywhere near a 99% renewal rate uh, in this or really any other industry. So this is an uncommon thing. We're very proud of it. It, ex it. it expresses success in one of the most important things that we've ever attempted, which is to give you a good outcome. And so we're proud that you stick with us at this rate but it also expresses something about the reliability of the organization that's important in a moment of economic uncertainty. Also, Appian is the only vendor that has won the customer's choice survey run by Gartner every year they've run it for large enterprises. We've been a customer's choice literally every time and we're the only vendor that's been a customer's choice every time for large enterprises. So this is the kind of reliability that you may look for in a recession and we wanna be here for you to provide that. The other thing you may look for is quick ROI. And this is where a recent purchase of ours comes in. You may be aware that four quarters ago, we added to the Appian 
architecture a terrific new product, uh, a terrific new product in the process mining space. Now, process mining allows you to analyze the processes, look through the data logs, understand what your organization is so that you can know how to make it more efficient, where the inefficiencies are, what you can do to improve it. Now, we've now added this to the process design picture so that you can do an analysis and then make improvements. And here's a picture of what we're doing right here. This is the savings scorecard. This allows you to, uh, to see how much you're saving by iterating and improving your process versus the way it used to be. It'll allow you to hone in on things that need to be improved the most, the biggest opportunities, and it will guide you and quantify the improvements that you've made. The other major feature that we've got now from process mining is the ability to mine data from Appian applications. So what we've done here is create a nice tight loop of, of self-improvement. You look at the Appian application, you see what could be better about it, you make the change, you look at it again, you see what could be better, you run this cycle, and you can get very good ROI by honing the Appian process. That's our intention. So both of these features are in beta, I should be clear, but they both exist, and uh, we're proud to be offering these ROI-centric features at a time when ROI is going to be especially valuable to the market. I'm going to wrap up the talk with three quick announcements. I know that InfoSec is on everyone's mind. In the last week or two in Australia, there have been, I believe, four major data breaches. Uh, so everybody's thinking about it and worrying about it. And I want you to know how important InfoSec is to Appian. It is our tradition, having started at the top of the market and worked with the largest organizations on the most demanding applications we have had to prioritize information security from day one, and we carry it forward today as a distinctive advantage of our firm in this market. Uh, for example, uh, you may be familiar with IRAP. Uh, IRAP is like uh, an independent security assessment. We're going to complete IRAP next quarter. So we're in process right now. We're going to finish it next quarter. We will continue our are uh, upholding our standard as a, as a leader in security and certifications. Second announcement out of three. We have a connected underwriting solution. It's about to, it's coming soon, right? But very, very soon. You'll be able to use this new solution to reduce the time to do a quote in insurance by connecting more easily to data sources across your enterprise, including, importantly, Guidewire, because we have a new partnership with Guidewire in which Appian is their first and only low-code partner. So with the strength of that affiliation and the connections, simple data inter interchange, but the commitment on both sides to make that easy for you, we're going to be offering a connected underwriting solution that should accelerate our ability to create a quote and improve the customer experience that comes from it. All right, last one. This is, a, this is a fun fact, just a comparison. I love it when this happens. We, we entered Appian's raw platform into an analysis uh, against commercial off-the-shelf self specialists in a market. In this case, the market is client lifecycle management solutions in FS. Uh, but we just took, this is just our raw platform. It's not a solution or an application built on Appian. It's just the platform. And as you can see, it comes out being one of the top vendors in the space as a raw platform. And if you can do this with the raw Appian platform, compete with the best specialists in the space and not give up any of the flexibility and agility and compatibility with other applications and all the great things that you get from a suite of automation tools backed by you know, a data fabric and all the flexibility and scalability and security that comes with our platform. And, and you can still be comparable with, with the very best in a pre-built vertical space then, then it's a really strong level of power that we're offering. And I love this for when you need to link this application to others across the enterprise, when you have to have a coherent security profile, when you have to reuse data and connections. Uh, there's so many advantages left over that aren't expressed in this quadrant and to still be competitive with, with the best product in the space. I, I, I just love this. And once in a while it happens, we're always entering the, the, the raw platform into these specialist quadrants. And it's great to see that it stacks up right at the top, uh, despite the, it, the, the lack of specialization that we brought to this analysis.
So, look, it is a great pleasure to be here. I'm so glad to be sharing this event with you in Sydney. Thank you for the warm welcome. I've been here all week and really enjoyed the meetings that I've had around town and seeing people at this conference. We have a fantastic community. I am delighted to be part of it. I'm delighted you're part of it. And I really thank you for the commitment that you've made to this platform and, and this, this area of exploration that we're all working on. You know, call it what you will, in the next few years, we are making a difference with automation, with data fabrics, with empowering people, making them capable of being coders and, and shaping their collaborations with computers. This is an exciting frontier right now in software, and we're all part of it. And I thank you very much for being part of that effort. So, good day. Thanks.